Hello everyone, uh, we're going to start in a few seconds. Before starting, however, we're going to start by doing a quick poll. Uh, it contains only two questions. It should pop up on your screen anytime soon. So the first question is, uh, where have you first heard about confluent entities? So how the webcast is going to go, we're going to do another question of this poll and then from there we're going to start with a very, uh, only just a few slides, uh, one or two, and then it's going to be a big product demonstration. Um, the demonstration will be in three stages. The first one, we're going to start developing an application from scratch, then the second demonstration um, will show the same application with several different uh, out-of-the-box producers configured to generate, um, to, to show you what we can generate with using CodeFluent entities. And then the last demonstration will import an existing application, an access database, uh, up to CodeFluent entities to show you how to migrate existing applications into new .NET applications. So we're waiting for everyone to answer the question and then we're going to go on to the next one. Thanks. And the second question, uh, what kind of .NET products do you use today? So um, we're going to see a lot of stuff during this session, um, so I'm not going to take questions during the demonstration. However, there will be um, a slide dedicated to that at the end of the presentation, so if you could write down your questions and keep them for, the, for, uh, for that particular time, that would be great. As soon as I've, everybody voted, we're going to start with a demonstration. Okay, great. Uh, so we're going to start with the with the webcast then. So uh, my name is Carl Anderson. I'm part of the product team uh, at SoftFluent, and uh, this um, this webcast is about CodeFluent entities. So I'm going to let you guys a few seconds so you can read this first slide explaining what is CodeFluent entities. Then I'm going to comment on it. So, what it means is that CodeFluent Entities is a code generator, which from a model containing your business logic, will generate 100% functional code. Uh, the generation isn't a one-shot action, instead it will be continuous throughout developments. The idea is that CodeFluent Entities will generate all the recurrent and low-value code, so that you'll be able to focus on what truly matters. Uh, we'll see how it works in the demo right afterwards. Uh, however, before diving into the demo, I'll, I'll just explain the global process of developing an application using CodeFluent entities. And the first step is to define your business logic in your model. Um, at this stage, we're totally agnostic of any technology. We specifically focus on the key concepts of um, our application, their properties, relations between one another, uh, business rules, and so on. The model isn't necessarily a single file. It can be chunked into what we call parts to increase readability and to allow team collaboration. Uh, I'd also like to emphasize um, that the model isn't a UML or data access or a mapping model. It really is a pragmatic model which only contains a functional description of your application and which is readable by non-technical users. And that's the key point which we'll see in the demonstration afterwards. Uh, everything is centralized in this model so you don't ever have to repeat yourself with different uh, database schemas, uh, class diagrams, or UML models. Once your functional elements have been defined, you need to specify the platforms you want to target. 
a SQL Server, a Oracle database, a C# -sharp object model, a VB.NET, a an ISP.NET website, maybe a WCS Markline, or even a SharePoint website. All those mentioned platforms are supported out of the box by Confluent entities. To do so, you're going to define what we call producers. Uh, each producer targets one and only one platform and translates this platform independent model into actual code. For instance, the SQL producer will generate a table for each entity, properties will become columns, methods will become stored procedures, and instances actual lines of data. On the other hand, the business object model producer will generate classes, properties, and methods for each of your entities, and so on. Each producer translates the platform independent concept into their equivalent for the target platform. Moreover, um, each generated layer knows how to interact with the other ones. So for instance, uh, the object model consumes the database and if you add the WCF producer, it will produce the contracts, services and proxies uh, which will allow you to consume the model and if you add the WPS from our client producer, it will generate WPF screens which can use the WCF uh, proxy services themselves using the uh, .NET object model using the database, and all that was entirely generated by Confluent entities. So at this stage, you'll already have 100% functional code, which you can compile and use right away. Nevertheless, we at SoftFluent, uh, we don't think that generated, generating entire enterprise class application from bottom to top is possible. There will always be some specific screen or specific and very complex business rule that will require some custom code. We don't intend to replace developers, uh, but instead help them get more productive by taking from their backs all of the tedious work so then they can focus elsewhere. So therefore, the generated code is entirely extensible. All classes are partial classes, and moreover, all those generated classes are just plain old classes, only implementing interfaces and not deriving from any base technical class. I'd also like to emphasize that all handmade extensions, such as partial classes, won't get overridden on the next generation. And this is also true in the database as well. Confluentities provides a diff engine which updates the database at each generation instead of dropping everything and recreating everything over. And by updating I mean that it will rename a column if you rename the property, or change a type if you change the property type. This way you'll never ever lose data and you'll always be able to continuously generate until your application is complete. Once you generate it and add in the custom logic that you wanted to, all you have to do is compile. Since Confluent Entities generates completely standard code, there's absolutely nothing specific to Confluent Entities at this stage. This is absolutely standard um, .NET development. And that's actually true from, from the extent stage up to the test stage. This is absolutely pure .NET development. So obviously those few steps from extend to test um, or in fact a sub-cycle in the application and can be uh, uh, in the development life cycle of the application and can be repeated as much as needed. However, if ever a structural change is needed, like adding an entity, um, renaming one, removing columns or whatever else, you're going to have to go back to the model, update it and generate over. And then you're off for a new cycle, add or modify custom code if needed and as desired, compile over again, test again, and um, and so on. If ever you realize that you need an extra entity, update the model and start a new cycle over again. Okay, well that's it for the theory. Uh, now that you're aware of how it globally works, uh, let's see how it goes in action and let's start with the demo. So I'm gonna get out of PowerPoint and um, as mentioned in the first slide, Confluent is, in, is integrated into Visual Studio 2010 or 2008. So I'm gonna start Visual Studio 2010. I'm going to create a new project. So prior to this demonstration, I installed Confluent entities on my laptop. And you can see that I have a new project template here. And the first part of the demonstration, I'm going to start with a brand new application. So I'm going to create a little auto, process, um, auto processing application from scratch. So here I'm going to name it auto process. And I'm going to name this project model since it will contain my Confluent entities model. And I'm going to remove, uh, I'm going to name the solution as my application or process. Then I'm going to put it here, click OK, and this will create my uh, Confluentities project. Here it's asking for my default namespace in which all my classes will be stored. So I'm going to keep the application name here. 
Now it's creating my autoprocess.model uh, project. And here you can see this Confluentes project, which is an absolutely standard uh, Visual Studio project. And we have several um, um, key concepts here, and the main one being uh, the surface, which offers this graphic view of your model. And this is where we're going to start working. So I'm going to start by adding a new entity here, and we're going to start by designing our auto process application. So I'm going to start by creating a new entity named customer, and I'm going to add it to a specific namespace. And just to show you that the product handles uh, multiple namespaces, which is not the case for every product, I'm going to add uh, the customer entity to the auto process .sales namespace. I'm going to click OK, and I'm going to repeat the same step for so, so I can create several entities and uh, have a little model. So I'm going to put the order entity in the same namespace here. And I'm also going to add a third entity, which is going to be the product entity, and which I'm going to add to another namespace just to show you the uh, multiple namespace uh, feature. So I'm going to name it autoprocess.catalog, for instance, there. Okay. And now we're gonna, I'm going to start by adding some uh, value properties to each of my entities. So I'm going to add a uh, identifier to my customer entity. I'm going to add an email. And uh, actually, you can see here, uh, you got two types of types. I can use standard types, which are native uh, built-in types in Confluent entities. Um, here you'll find some standard CLR types, such as uh, dead times, strings, cars, bulls, and all that, but you can you also find some more advanced types such as um, password rich string, um, binary large objects, documents, audio, video, XML, and all that. And so here I'm not I'm not designing columns or anything. This, those are platform independent, and the the producers will then uh, translate those types into actual um, platform specific types. So here it's an email. So I'm going to put that as an email so that the UI producer will will um, uh, know how to handle that string properly. Okay, so on the order, I'm going to add a new. Uh, I'm going to add a reference, which will be of the GUID type. I'm also going to add another property, which I'm going to name price, and which I'll set up to the to be a currency. Okay, and in the product here, I'm going to add an identifier, as well as a name of the string type. Okay, so here I got basic value properties. Uh, I'm going to add some some relations and some more advanced properties. So I'm going to add a new property here, and uh, I'm going to name it orders as a customer can have uh, one or many orders. And I'm going to keep the string type just to show you a nice feature as well. Uh, I'm going to do it as well on the order entity. I'm going to add a, a, a property here, which I'm going to name uh, customer as an order is linked to a single customer. I'm going to keep the string type here as well. And I kept the string types just to show you this feature. If I hold the shift key and click on a property, I get this arrow uh, which will let me um, define a relation between two entities from a, a source property to a target property. So here I'm going to point to the orders property and I'm going to say that one customer can have many orders, so that's actually my second sentence here. And if you take a look at the bottom of the, of the, of the dialog here, I get this composition group box allowing me um, to set up composition relationships or aggregations such as a book can have several pages so that if you're deleting the book, you should delete all pages as well or save and, and do that. So I'm not going to do that here, but just, just, to, just so you know that it exists. And you can do that afterwards uh, using the property, um, the property grid. Okay, so here I'm going to do exactly the same here on the on the order entity. I'm going to add a new property of the product type, and I'm I'm going to say products. I'm going to keep the string type, and here it's a many-to-many -many relationship. It does not have a target property, so I'm going to make it point to the entity, saying that it does not have a target property. And here, products have many orders, so that's my many-to-many. That's the sentence corresponding to my many-to-many -many relationship cardinality that I want to set on this relationship. So I'm going to hit save, and there I got my basic model. Another, another cool feature with the product here is that it also natively um, handles and supports enumerations. So uh, I'm going to create a new enumeration here, uh, such as an order status enumeration. 
which I'm going to add to the uh, cells namespace. So here's my status enumeration, and I'm going to add some new values to that one, such as a to be delivered, delivered, there we go. Uh, I'm going to add another one saying that it's in progress. And we're going to add a third one, which says that it was shipped. Okay, great. And now in my order entity, I'm going to add a new property here. And I'm going to name it status. And instead of using the standard type, I'm going to use the advanced type so that you can see uh, this view. So here, I could have uh, created my relationship this way, selecting a project type. Um, just I wanted to show you the, the sexier arrow pointing feature. Uh, so here I could select my order status. Uh, you can also see here that I can browse through three other types so that you could actually use standard .NET enumerations such as the system day of week or anything like that. You can actually map your properties to those actual .NET types. So here, uh, in our case, uh, we're going to use the order status uh, enumeration that we declared. So I'm simply going to select that one, click OK. OK, all right. So here at this stage, we have this platform independent, uh, totally agnostic um, of any technology uh, model. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's pretty small, not much entities there. Um, obviously, if, if I had hundreds of entities, they may not all fit on, on this surface. And that's why the surface is all vectorial, it's all WPF here, so you can actually uh, navigate and zoom on, 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 on entities and follow relationships using control and clicking on those relation entities. You can also split models, as I mentioned on the first slide. Uh, I, don't, you know, I don't know if you remember, but uh, you can actually split those surfaces and say, for instance, that each surface should hold only one namespace. It's actually the same with the XML parts behind it. You can actually split those parts in several parts for readability reason or, or just to be able to, to allow team collaboration so that teams, entire teams, can actually collaborate on the same model. By the way, talking about team collaboration, um, Coastal Nancy's project actually support the source control that is configured in Visual Studio so that all source controls uh, supported by Visual Studio are supported uh, out of the box uh, uh, by the product. Uh, that's one of the benefits of being a, an extension to Visual Studio. Okay, um, so this being said, so you remember my, my application development lifecycle slide. Here we are the first stage. Uh, we design the, the the business uh, logic of our application, as you can see, is very pragmatic, um, pretty straightforward, and non-technical users can actually read that. So now the next step is actually to generate from that. And the way Coflin Entities does it, is that it uses, it, it, it infers a meta model from this model, and then we'll call each producer, which will translate this meta model into actual code. It's not template-based. And you can actually see this inferred meta model by clicking the view inferred meta model um, in the ribbon. So here, I'm going to view what, what Coflin Entities understood from my model, and you can see that it um, it created a business object layer here, uh, corresponding with both of all my namespaces and and classes and and enumeration that which I declared, and it also created a virtual uh, UI as well as a platform dependent database layer, and you can actually view all the tables here, and you can see that I have all my well one table per entity. Uh, Likewise, I created a many-to-many -many relationship between order and product entity, the order and product entities. You can see that it automatically inferred an association table between the two. And all that is in the meta model. Uh, this is still platform independent. It's not Oracle or SQL Azure or any uh, specific database uh, technology. This is all virtual and in memory. And this is what actually what, what, what the producers will translate afterwards. And here uh, you can see my customer entity. I got my ID and, and property, uh, ID property and email property. But I also have some more columns that were deduced, well, inferred from my model. Now this is because by default I got tra a tracking feature for time and user changes that is enabled uh, by default on all entities. And I also have a reversion column here, which is enabled by default because I got a concurrency. The concurrency uh, feature is enabled by default in Confluent entities. And so what's great with this meta model uh, uh, logic, the fact that it's model-based generation, we'll be able to uh, tweak and turn some buttons and apply application-wide changes here. So what I'm going to do is using the property grid here, I'm going to select my project, 
and uh, I'm actually going to change that for all entities. So here I got this default concurrency mode which is set to default which is optimistic. I'm going to set it to known so this will actually remove this rule version column everywhere and it will it, this just I just disable for my entire application um, the concurrency management. And if I switch to the advanced um, view of the property grid, here I got default entity tracking modes and if I check that you can see they have time and user tracking. So I'm gonna uncheck those. Okay. And then if I go back oh well on the simple view here, um, and also cool feature with the product is that it uh, it allows you to specify some naming conventions for all your database objects. So here we were using the default one. Uh, well, the product provides out of the box um, six or, uh, five or six different naming conventions. Here I used the uppercase one uh, so that you know you can actually provide your own custom naming conventions. It's a simple, uh, it's a very straightforward interface which, which you need to implement. And now if we take a look at the inferred model again and go back into this uh, virtual um, database, you can see that all my tables are now uh, in uppercase and all my columns as well. So here I rename my entire database object just by turning a button. Uh, you can also see that I don't have the tracking columns anymore since I disabled this feature. I, and likewise, I don't have the uh, concurrency column anymore. So this is thanks to Confluent Entities. By turning button, you can apply application-wide changes. What's great with Confluent Entities is actually it also provides a great feature named Confluent Aspects, which actually allow you to create your own little code that can uh, apply changes to this meta model before, before anything is uh, generated. So we provide ex some several different aspects which allow you, for instance, to uh, to localize uh, your your data uh, at runtime and uh, uh, it allows you to implement uh, Google-like text search in your applications. And what what for instance the localization one, what it does is that it adds a LCID uh, column to all of you uh, to all of your uh, all of your tables and then in the C chart it will add uh, in all your methods it will add the uh, LCID property uh, so that it will select from using the, the current uh, uh, thread culture so that those are great great features uh, you can actually code your own it's all documented and what's great is that once you externalize those features into an aspect you'll be able to reuse those um, uh, from project to project and and apply them on on, on entire applications. Okay, so that's it for the uh, metamodel part. Uh, we're actually going to generate, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some some um, standard uh, Visual Studio projects here and I'm going to start by adding a class library project which I'm going to name order process as my default namespace. I'm also going to add another standard Visual Studio project uh, which will contain my persistent scripts here at new project. I'm going to name it uh, order process dot persistence order process dot persistence. Oops, persistence. There we go. And then I'm going to add a third project uh, named order process dot console app, which will be a, a small console application and and um, this project will allow me to show you how to use the generated code and to show you that this generated code is um, entirely functional. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to name it order process dot console app. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to set this one as a starter project. Great. And now what we need to do is so we have this platform dependent model and I'm going to add producers which will translate this platform dependent model into actual code. So I'm going to start by adding a uh, SQL Server producer here which will uh, generate the persistent scripts and deploy them on my server. And here the, um, it's going to generate the persistent scripts into my persistence project. I'm also going to add another, uh, another producer which will generate my .NET uh, classes. You can, you can see here that you can actually select uh, the language that that you want to target. So uh, once we invested into creating this model, simply by pushing a button, you can actually generate into uh, VB.NET or in or in C Sharp, which is actually pretty. Uh, it's a pretty neat feature. Okay, so here I'm selecting the auto process class library project. 
and I'm going to generate in C sharp. Great, and uh, that's actually it. So here I'm going to select my my um, my project. I'm going to hit build, and so this will infer this meta model, and then this will launch each of my producer one by one, which will translate this meta model into actual code. And what's great with the SQL Server producer is that, as mentioned earlier, uh, it includes a diff engine, which will actually run the scripts and uh, apply them on my database. So here you can see the code is generating, and it adds my references. Uh, it also created my uh, classes in the appropriate namespaces, which I desired. And I also generated all my persistent scripts here and, de and deployed them on my local uh, SQL Server. So here, let's just open up uh, Management Studio to show you that it created my auto process database there auto process here it is and you can find my tables that are named according to my naming convention and now if I start you know creating uh, well obviously I've, I've just created my uh, my database I don't have any data but just to show you that everything is there and ready to be used so here I'm actually going to uh, do some changes in my model for instance I'm going to add an instance here so that I, I'm going to have some data as soon as I generate my application. So I'm going to create a t-shirt. I'm also going to add a new property which I'm going to name description. And I'm going to create another instance here with a description. Oops, not a property, an instance. You can use the uh, contextual menu or the ribbon. It's exactly the same actually. Uh, code and here I'm going to set this is a description. Great, so now if I build over again, this will update all my database, adding this description column. It will uh, update my store processors uh, so that they're going to load and save the description column as well. And the same in my C-sharp classes, uh, they all have the description property. So if I run the script over again, uh, you can see that I have my two uh, two lines of data, a code and t-shirt with uh, a null value for my t-shirt because I did not um, set up any um, description value in the instance as well as a uh, this is a description which was my description in my model. And everything was updated so now what we're going to do is we're going to use the uh, the generated code here so I'm going to go um, wait in my project I need to reference the class uh, the uh, class library project or else it's not going to work and I also need to uh, to reference the Windows base as well as the Kotlin runtime, as it implements interfaces in both of those uh, in both of those um, uh, references. Um, so here I'm going to load all my products. For instance, I'm going to go product. I'm sorry, product collection. There, products and simply call product collection dot little and I'm going to iterate through all those products and print them on the screen. So I'm going to go products and console dot uh, right line product and I'm going to print its name. So I'm going to go p dot name there. So now if I hit, uh, I'm simply going to configure my my uh, solution so that when I hit control F5 uh, it goes as fast as possible meaning that it's not going to build my persistent scripts and nor deploy them as Kotlin does it for me and no need to build my my uh, uh, model as well each time I hit F5 and I'm going to hit control F5 it's going to run my console application and you, we should see two products appearing on the console a t-shirt and a product so it builds everything you can see that everything compiles right away, everything is functional. And so me as a developer, I only need to focus on the model and then use the generated code. I don't need to do, uh, I don't need to spend time with all the plumbing anymore. Great. Uh, so obviously to create an entire enterprise class application, you're going to need more than just a little loadal method. And you're going to need to be able to create some more advanced store processors. And Cosmancy provides um, another concept named a method uh, which is actually a platform independent store processor. You can also create platform specific. Uh, you can actually uh, um, uh, put some uh, row, some snippets, or some row um, TSQL or PLSQL in your models. Uh, however, 
uh, the key feature is that you know try to be as more platform independent as you can so that supporting a new uh, technology is, becomes as easy as adding a new producer. So here I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a load by status. Um, I don't remember who, uh, yeah, it's in my products. It's a load by status method. And so I'm going to write what we call CFQL, which is Confluent Query Language, which is a mix w between SQL and um, object-oriented syntax. Everything is documented. And you can see I got an IntelliSense here helping me build my CFQL, um, my CFQL statement. So here I'm basically saying that I should load all uh, orders where the status equals the, the past status. Great, so I got this method. However, I don't have any data, so I'm going to add some instances so that when I'll use this method, uh, something will pop up on the screen. So I'm going to start by creating a new customer name, info at softwind.com. I'm also here uh, going to add a new instance there. I'm going to put an order with a, a price to $42, uh, status shipped, set it to the customer that I've just created, and also going to assign to this order the two products that I created previously. Hit OK, save the model, build over again, and once again this will uh, update my database layer as well as my C-sharp class so that all I have to do is just use it in my, um, uh, in my application. So if I go back here, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to load all my orders. So I'm going to go order collection, orders. And here, instead of using the default uh, loadal method that gets generated, I'm going to use the load by status method, and I'm going to pass the uh, uh, ship status as, it, as 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 my only instances of the ship status. And here, I'm going to go order O in orders, and I'm going to print on the console the price of my order. So I'm going to go order dot price is O dot price. Okay, great. So now if I hit Control F5, I should see the two products as well as my $42 product. Great, awesome, right? Um, sweet, so now let's get back to the code. Um, so here I created some custom uh, method. Uh, what about my business rules? Uh, what if I want to set up some validation on, on my email property, for instance? So GoFluent uh, also provides a rule concept. And you can see that we have um, there are several different types of rules that are uh, that can be added. You can add validation rules, transactions, security rules, lifecycle events, which are great if you want to extend the generated model, and which we're going to see later in the demonstration. And um, you can also actually call external rules, uh, implementing in external rule engines. Um, if, if ever you're using some some more advanced uh, rule engine products. You can also create your own custom rules if you want to and extend the product. Your uh, everything is documented for that. So here I'm going to add a validation rule in my email, and I want to make sure that the email that gets typed in by the user is a properly formatted email. And you can see that I have some more advanced um, properties here. So says I can specify uh, which domains I consider valid. So here, for instance. Uh, I'll consider an email valid my application only if it comes from the selfluent.com domain. So I'm going to hit OK, and once again, I'm going to build over so that it updates all my layers. OK, so it's updating everything. I'm going back in the code. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new customer, and uh, this customer will, be with, will have an invalid email so that we can see that this validation rule is actually enforced. So I'm going to go email, and I'm going to add a um, test at hotmail.com, which is actually a valid email, but considered invalid by my uh, application because of its validation rules. So I'm going to go validate. And since it's invalid, this will actually throw a Copfluent entities, uh, a Copfluent validation exception, which I'm going to catch, and I'm actually going to display uh, the exception on the console called fluent validation exception here, there, X, and I'm simply going to go console.writeline, and I'm going to print the exception, the, the exception message without the technical code there. Okay, so I'm going to hit control F5, build everything over again, 
And here, as you can see, I know how this, uh, this error message saying that my test.admail.com message, well, the value for email has an invalid domain. And uh, list of valid domains are softwind.com. So obviously, you can customize this message, and you can also localize it depending on the, the language used in your, in your application. Um, cool. Uh, I also mentioned how to, that, that, that you could easily extend generated code, and we're going to see how to do that. So here, uh, we're going to add actually a new rule. And um, instead of using a, um, a validation rule, we're going to use one of those lifecycle event rules. And those, are, those, those events actually allow you to plug in any time in the lifecycle of an entity. So here, we're going to plug in uh, right before it says, for instance. And simply what I'm going to do is I'm going to build over this model again. And like previously, um, here you'll see that when I'll compile my, my business object model, I'll get this compilation error saying that uh, the customer entity uh, expects an on before save method. And that's normal because it's not implemented by default. This is something that I I should create. And if you remember what I said at the very beginning of this presentation, I said that all partial cl uh, all classes that get generated with Coastal entities are actually partial classes. So we're going to add a, a, a customer dot partial class, and we're going to and this one, which is not as it's not generated by the product, uh, won't get overridden throughout generations. So I'm going to create a public partial class to specify the compiler that it's just an extension of the customer class. Exactly the same. So here, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to implement my on before save method there. And here I'm simply going to write on the console a little message uh, so that we know on before she says that we know that we went into this uh, into this one. Okay, so I'll get back into the program, and here uh, I'm going to switch my validate method to the save method. As the save method automatically calls the validate method, I need to specify a valid email here. So I'm going to put selffluent.com, selffluent. There we go. I hit save, and so here, if I hit Control F5, we should see the on before save method appear at the end of the console, it's right there. So this is how you would extend um, Cosplanity's generated code. And here, if you remember my application development lifecycle slide, I've, I've went through several uh, cycles, always going, if, whenever I needed to add a new business feature or new uh, uh, concept, I would go back to the model, change that, generate over again, go back, compile code as uh, I would always do, uh, standard.NET code, extend if needed, and compile over again and, and, and run my application and do that over and over again until I'm scope complete. Uh, so obviously you're putting, a, you're investing a lot in this model and just to show you that uh, those models are, they're not, uh, it's not a binary format or anything like that, it's, uh, it's just standard XML which is actually human readable. So here you can see that I got this project, uh, having a customer entity, uh, it has several properties with a, uh, the ID property, the key property, and so on. And um, actually, those two views, the XML view and the surface view, are just uh, just two views of the same model. So you can actually use uh, one or the other view depending on on what you want to do. So here, I could, for instance, create a new property here, which I'm going to name extra email with the rule. And so here, if I hit Control S to save you'll see that it will appear uh, in the UI as well here. So you can really use the one or the other. And the XML is very handy if you want to do massive changes like uh, replacing um, uh, a, a string by another one or it's really great to pre-process or post-process, do processing operations on the model. So uh, there's a lot of value uh, with, with this bidirectional uh, synchronization between XML and, and uh, the model. Okay, so this is for the first step of the demonstration. Um, I'm actually going to switch to another, to the exact same application, but with some extra producers uh, to show you what Cosplay Entities can generate. So here I'm going to open that one. And you'll see that it's exactly the same model. And the only difference is that I just added some extra producers. And they're equivalent um, uh, Visual Studio projects, obviously. 
So here you find my uh, auto process model, and if I open the model, it's exactly the same one. I'm nothing specific about it. Uh, the only difference is here, instead of simply having the SQL Server as well as the Business Object Model Producer, I have way more than those. Uh, I got the WCF Service Producer, which uh, generates my um, WCF contracts, services, as well as a proxy, taking care of all the communication aspects uh, of my application. I also added a, an instance of the uh, Template Producer, which will generate my WCF configurations. I also added the WPF Smart Client Producer here, which translates this model into a WPF screens using the uh, generated WCF uh, proxy services and proxy and services as and I also added the uh, SharePoint web parts here uh, producer which generates uh, an actual SharePoint website uh, web parts and uh, pages and we'll see what it generates so I'm just going to build over so that it updates all my layers and uh, supports all those technologies and I'm going to show you the uh, the actual output Okay, great. Um, so here, if we go back into our order process uh, project, you can see that now I have the services uh, namespace, and I actually have the WCF contracts exposing my business object model um, on the web, and it also generated this proxy here, uh, which is actually uh, a, which is a remote version of this uh, server-side uh, business object model, which we'll call the uh, smart client object model, which takes care of all communication and what's great about it is that it will give me as a developer the same ease of development as if I was um, developing a server-side application uh, I will still handle uh, product and product collections and and objects like that and the smart client is it's this WPF application using all that so here what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit control F5 and this will start my WPF services, my WCF services, sorry, in a console application. And then it will start my WPF application using those services right afterwards. So you can see my services are starting right now. And here's my console application. So now my services are started. And so this uses a template-based um, uh, generation. So you can actually change the look and feel of the, of the application. Uh, the w PF producer is actually in beta, so it's just uh, just an example here. So here you can find my um, my two instances, oh, my two lines of data that, which I created earlier. And what's great about it is that since those, uh, I mean, it's using the same database, it's using the same business object uh, uh, layer, so that I, I'll find all my business rules. So here, if I try to put a, an invalid email here and try to save, I'm going to have the same. Um, validation rule enforced and with the same validation message and I'll find that it all my uh, all my clients all my UIs uh, if I for instance start with the uh, SharePoint producer UI so what the SharePoint producer uh, generates is actually web parts but, what's, but more than that it also knows how to create an entire document library and and the pages with, with those web parts configured to use one another so that you can actually try them right away so I'm going to open that. You can see that there's one folder per namespace. Oh, wait. I'm just going to refresh the page first. Okay, great. And uh, here I'm going to list all my customers. So that's those are 100% generated, just like the smart client producer, uh, just like the the WPS smart client that you've seen earlier. This is all 100% generated. And I got two web parts here is a, the entity grid web part, which is connected to the uh, uh, entity form web part. And you can see that I can list them. I can also uh, edit a, uh, an entity. And likewise, I mean, it all uses the same business object uh, layer. So here, if I put Hotmail here and try to save, I'll get the same validation error here. So um, all I'm taking care of is the business logic, the UIs, and the specific stuff and all the plumbing gets done by the tool. Uh, likewise, if I, for instance, uh, they're, they're all using the same uh, business layer, so here if I, for instance, add a new customer, let's say, uh, not test, but support at softfluent.com, there support at softfluent.com, there, and if I refresh this, 
if I refresh this page, sorry, oops, there, if I refresh this page, there it, it appears and all are connected, they're all using the same uh, database. So really, um, supporting a new technology gets as easy as uh, adding a new producer, mostly. So, uh, getting back here, oh no, that's in the wrong project here. Uh, one last point is you can see that at the bottom of my solution here, I got this autoprocess.web app. Uh, this is not generated by Coastal Entities. Uh, I edited it myself. I used the uh, standard Visual Studio uh, MVC, uh, ISP.NET MVC template, and I simply added a customer's uh, controller as well as a view. And you can see that it's, it gets, it's almost as easy as, uh, I mean, it's like creating my console application. I'm simply doing customer at all, and, and, and the business object model that gets generated that can actually be used across all .NET applications. So here I'm going to set that as the starter project, and and we're going to and uh, we're going to start it. So I'm going to go Control F5. Here my ISP.NET development server is starting, and um, so this this is not generated. I did it myself, but just to show you that um, the generated business object model can be used in um, any types of .NET applications. Uh, they can be ISP.NET, um, web forms, MVC, WinForms, console applications, uh, WPF. You can use the, the generated proxy by the WCF service producer in Serverlite as well. Um, and here you'll find, once again, all my data is all using the same um, bricks so that if I start putting an invalid email here and start save, I'm going to get the same uh, validation errors. So. What I want to show you with this demonstration is um, thanks to this centralized model and this uh, producer logic, you can really decouple your, your business logic from the technology and survive technology, technology shifts. Uh, so the last, the, the last demonstration that I want to show you is um, working with existing code. Uh, if you have an existing application, an existing database, uh, how, you, uh, how you can use and benefit from Confluent entities. So I'm going to create a new project which we'll name Northwind, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to import the uh, access database, uh, the Northwind access database, which is a sample database provided by Microsoft. So I'm going to select this folder there, Northwind, and instead of creating from a, uh, an entire application from scratch, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go import, and using the import wizard, I'm going to point to Microsoft Access. You can see that we support different types of um, inputs that we can Im import from, such as SQL servers, OED, any OEDB uh, databases, uh, IDEO.NET entity framework um, models, uh, UML models, Oracle databases, and uh, MySQL server databases. So here I'm going to hit Next. I'm going to point to my Access database, which is in my documents. And I'm going to go look for the uh, .accdb as soon as the uh, window pops up. There we go. And so here's my documents. And uh, I'm going to look for the .accdb. And there it is. OK, great. And uh, the default namespace will be Northwind. And the target part will be Northwind.cfp. I'm going to hit Next, Next, Next. And I was connecting to the database, iterating. Uh, it will create one entity per table. It will uh, deduce from the um, foreign keys and all uh, the relationships and uh, all I need. So now if I open my model, oops, I opened the XML, but that's, uh, that's pretty much the same. And uh, if I open my surface now, uh, there you can see I got my complete model here uh, with its um, with its uh, relationships and, uh, and and all that. So now uh, I can start a new cycle. I can create a brand new .NET application. But if I have a database such as an Oracle database, uh, I can also use the I can specify uh, the Oracle producer and actually generate code on the existing database. So I can update that one and keep on working with uh, the existing persistence layer and just create entirely new layers and uh, modernize my application. Okay, so this is it for the demonstration. I'm going to go back uh, in, the, in PowerPoint um, with a few more slides. 
Um, before concluding, I'd like to show you some extra features of the product that are out of the box and that were not uh, that that were not demoed um, in this uh, in this webcast. So the main application-oriented feature provided out of the box by the product are uh, that you can are uh, modeling and generation of standard ISP.NET membership role and profile providers. You can also, um, I mean, all generated .NET classes support data binding, sorting, paging using Microsoft best practices. Uh, through the message concept, um, in Confluencies, you can generate standard .NET resources, and using the localization aspect, you can add lo data localization to your projects. Uh, using the cache the producer, you can add caching uh, capabilities to your middle tail. You can also add, and we mentioned it briefly, um, Google Ad Text Search uh, into your application using the middle of Word uh, text search aspect. And uh, so on. I mean, we, you can also, uh, we talked about the WCF support briefly and il illustrated it with the uh, uh, WPS Smart Client application that I showed. Um, blobs uh, are handled natively between all, across all application. And what's great with that feature is that blobs are streamed from layer to layer. And, and the product also provides UI controls um, so you can easily manipulate them in your UIs. Um, we have many more aspects uh, which you can use. You can also create your own. We also provide a runtime library um, which provides lots of controls and classes to easier custom developments. Uh, Confluent Artists also provide, um, can also generate emulated uh, SharePoint lists which can be used without SharePoint so you can use Excel and Access as front-end clients to your, of your database. So, I mean, there's way more features in the product, and the goal of this slide isn't to list them all, but instead to make a clear statement that Confluent Entities is not an ORM, and uh, uh, instead it really is an advanced code generator. Uh, it will take care of all your recurrent needs, uh, all the ones that we have in those modern applications, so that we can focus on the key features of our application. So the key points using this tool are that first, that you're using a centralized model. You don't ever repeat yourself. You don't have a UML model here with several diagrams and another mapping model here, there, and, um, and so on. You get a single model inside Visual Studio that drives all your developments. And uh, this is possible thanks to the second key point, which is that you can generate continuously. And it's not a one-shot action, it, but it's done as you've seen in the demo. Um, you can do this until your scope complete, and the com combination of those two points are, are of a great value because in the end, you actually have an actual, an actual snapshot of what the application handles and how it does it. So you can come back years later, open this model again, and get a clear picture of what's in production. Another key point is flexibility. Uh, using this tool, you're decoupling your business from the technology. Once you've invested in the time into creating this model, then supporting a new technology comes down to adding a new producer. Uh, using Confluent Entities, you can go from VB.NET to C-Sharp by pushing a button, which I've, which I've shown you in, uh, which you've seen at the beginning when I added the uh, business object model producer. And you can also change your persistence layer from Oracle to database, uh, Oracle database to Azure, or, and vice versa, just by changing and switching your producer. So, uh, in the end, the main benefits using this tool is that you get an increased uh, code prediction control. Uh, it structures your teamwork. Uh, it allows you to absorb functional changes smoothly thanks to this centralized model and this uh, continuous generation. Uh, um, um, you, you get um, you can decouple your your, your business from technology thanks to the producer logic, minimize risks as most of the code is now generated and create predictability thanks to the metrics uh, that are provided. So I didn't show that, but uh, in, in the um, Confluence project, you can also create reports um, and get metrics on the number of entities, the number of methods, rules, and snippets, and uh, all, all that you want. Um, so I don't have much more time. Um, but I will also want to say that there's a free version that is available online. It's unlimited in time and features for non-commercial use. So I really invite you to try the product and see for yourself if it suits your needs. So this is it for the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, really feel free to ask them. You can use the um, um, control panel on the right and uh, type in your questions in the uh, question um, uh, in the question bar.
Okay, so I can see there are several questions. Um, how continuous generation works? Uh, this is all thanks, to, uh, this is mostly thanks to the uh, a producer, or the database producers, uh, which have a diff engine. So what it does is, um, what it does is that it looks at what's what's in the database and the changes that you're applying and it only applies the delta so that you're not losing changes. It does not drop the database to recreate it. Um, would this be used in place of N Hibernate or uh, they, uh, can they be used together? Uh, and Hibernate is only for data access. Uh, using the tool we can create way more than that, like SharePoint um, web parts or WCF services. Um, you, I, I don't know, I guess you could create your own uh, accessing model, uh, but then that would kind of lose uh, the power of Cloudflare entities on that, on that part. Um, since Cloudflare entities provide its own data access method. Can I get a copy of the presentation? Um, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll share that online. Uh, how much does it cost? Uh, we're actually uh, changing the prices right now. Uh, all the information is available online. So here, if uh, let me show you the web page, so southfluent.com, um, products and in Cofluent entities, there, wait, uh, here, purchase, so you got different licensing. Uh, we're actually working on the licensing model, so really um, feel free to contact our sales team at sales at um and ask for a quotation. Really, uh, uh, they act, I know they're actually working on the licensing model to, to get a cheaper, um, to make a uh, answer ticket uh, cheaper, so uh, they're working on it. Um, how does this integrate with the entire structure? Well, as you've seen, using the producer, uh, you can create any architecture that you want. And uh, here we created an entire structure, but you could, I mean, you could, you really can create the uh, architecture for your application that you wish simply by um, using one producer or, or, or another and, and all that. What is the main advantage of a light switch? Well, light switch is only for civil light. Um, uh, you can, create WCF services, you can create, I mean, you can create whatever you want and, and, and develop uh, as you wish uh, outside of that. I assume that there are plans to add um, a producer to support generating object that will all also work with WinRT. Uh, yes, totally. We actually have, uh, so first, WinRT can be consumed in .NET, so um, as is, this should work. Then um, we'll also plan to support WinRT objects natively, and we'll see how we do that. Will the plugin work with VS11? Yes, it al already does. Um, what about automatic deployment on Azure? Uh, I haven't showed that, but uh, the SQL Azure uh, producer has exactly the same features as the SQL Server producer. Uh, you can actually work locally, and then once you are ready to go live, just simply point on your uh, SQL Azure database online, and then deploy uh, your database out there. Uh, how it differs from Microsoft Entity Framework? Uh, well, the thing is that Microsoft Entity Framework is uh, it's, it's just a data accessing tool. Or it's also pretty recent. Our tool is six years old. There wasn't an Entity Framework at the time, and it does way more than that, um, like you know, generating uh, WPF applications or WCF services uh, and so on, and all that in a single tool with a single project driving all your developments, whereas a T framework is just a model generating all classes inside one of the project. Uh, the personal version is the free version. Um, it's uh, for non-commercial application, and you can also use it as an evaluation model. How is it better than Iron Speed? Um, I don't know Iron Speed myself. Um, I've never really used it on, on an enterprise application project. I think that Iron Speed is based on templates. Um, so here, since you have a model-driven approach, uh, you can combine features and go way more, uh, way further than that. Uh, never mind. Okay, uh, it's possible to create mock objects to automate tests without using without use of database uh, layers. That's not possible out of the box, but I guess you could uh, you you could actually create a producer yourself. That's actually very simple to do. It's a simple interface to implement. I producer. It has three methods: initialize. Uh, um, produce and uh, terminate, and you can uh, you could actually create such objects easily. Uh, can you create? Yes, you can create your own producer. That's the old principle of Cofluent. Is it's a white box. You can really extend and do whatever you want. 
Does it support link queue and lambda expressions? Uh, yes, Confluentity supports from .NET 2 up to .NET 4.5. And uh, there's actually, so it depends what you want to say with link queue, but yeah, you can, uh, there's actually a sub-producer, which is the uh, link queue to the SQL producer, so you can, uh, which decorates all your business object model with the proper uh, attributes so that you can um, create um, link queue expressions uh, using some, Actually, some producer actually produce Lambda expressions as well uh, because it's more convenient in some cases. So you can totally do that. Uh, how do you use uh, third-party controls? Uh, we all so all classes that get generated are um, implement standard interfaces. So they're uh, so so the the thing thanks to that it actually supports all those third parties in Fajestic, Telerik, and all that. We and we actually uh, we're, we're actually good friends with them. So. Um, Using our tool does not provide does not does not prevent you from using those tools, and you can actually combine them, uh, those those controls with the tool to create great applications. Uh, not o not only about the storage in Azure, uh, but about the application, the services. Can we develop directly from the Visual Studio? Oh, deploy directly. Um, so. About Azure, about the support of the Azure platform, the thing is, Confluency supports uh, uh, SQL Azure, and you can deploy directly from Visual Studio into and create your database uh, on Azure, and you can do that, no problems. Uh, other than that, for the classes and services and roles and all that, uh, uh, the product does not provide anything specific, because uh, you can actually simply, you can create your own uh, Azure project, and then simply use the standard Visual Studio tools to deploy uh, um, same for the blob storage, actually. Um, do I have to put the generated code through testing? Well, no, we're testing it for you. That's the old principle. Uh, using the tool, you're minimizing your risks. Uh, how easy to develop and install the stop application on older version of Windows OS? Oh, we're supporting all OSs from Windows XP to uh, 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 Windows 7. Uh, well, all, all, all you need is the .NET framework, and you can do whatever you want with, with it. And like I said, we're supporting uh, the .NET framework from the .NET framework 2 up to .NET framework 4, and we'll, we'll work with the uh, .NET framework 4.5 and, and the new versions with it. So the commercial license versions, it's relative free license, uh, such as once you, we build a product for a client in Cosmos, there's no additional fee, is it the cost of the tool per dev? Yes, uh, the idea is that it's per developer. Um, you don't have, I mean, you're not paying, you're not paying any, you're not getting charged deploying it on servers or anything like that. It's really a developer tool. Uh, how do we stand in using non-SQL uh, non-SQL databases. Uh, as of today, we do not provide out-of-the-box uh, non-SQL uh, uh, database producer for Cassandra, stuff like that. Um, but you could, uh, you could do, I, I mean, um, send us a mail to what you want to do. Uh, we're totally open on that. Why not, uh, why not, why not developing such producer? And um, if you like the tool, you can also develop your own producer to, to, to generate the code that you want for, for those kind of databases. Is there any university that uses your product? Um, actually, we have a lot of students. Um, I don't know precisely. I don't have names to give you right now, but uh, send us a mail at info at um, I'm not sure what you want with this question. Uh, I, we, we, we can answer, give you more information on that. Does the app put a low for, yes, totally. That's the old principle as well. Um, really, uh, I really invite you if uh, just, Grab the tool and load it and try it yourself. You'll see uh, it's very easy to to work th with the tool and um, and uh, you can customize anything that you want. So if ever you do not like something, you can change it easily. Uh, ID Blades Dev Force. Uh, um, I don't know the tool um, actually, so I wouldn't be able to compare with Dev Force. Is anything lost by not using uh, Entity Framework? Uh, not really. Uh, Entity Framework is really for data access. Actually, we, uh, if you do want to use, because data Entity Framework is a great tool for for accessing data in some scenarios, and we actually provide an Entity Framework producer so that if for some reason you want to use Entity Framework in your project, you can produce the Entity Framework uh, data model and then from it generate your classes to have your Entity Framework uh, object um, objects if you want to. 
Um, is your caching on the server or on the client? Uh, what we what we provide? Well, it depends. But what we provide? Um, so uh, what we provide is uh, we have a sub producer which generates a caching uh, which adds caching capabilities to the business object layer. So if you're creating a a, a uh, ISP .NET website, for instance, this will be on the server side, but uh, in the middle tier, so that it it uh, it will is um, it will put less load on on the database. Uh, then on the caching on the client side, we don't have uh, like in the browser, you mean, and stuff like that. Uh, no, we don't provide provide out of uh, out of the box, but we do provide uh, controls that that have kind of the same behavior, saying that if you're asking uh, twice for the same image or document, for instance, you get a three or four, saying that it did not change, so that uh, IE or Firefox will not download the the document twice. Um, NonSQL, where can, uh, can I get more details on this store concept? Its interface, primitives, etc. Uh, well, in the documentation would be a good start. Um, that would be um, softwindcom slash documentation. Also, if um, any of you have any question afterwards, I'm just going to show you this slide. You can uh, you can contact us on the forums or at info at softwindcom. Really feel free. Uh, we're usually trying to be as reactive as possible, so feel free to ask your questions on the forums. Uh, would you want to create deployment projects separately? Um, what do you mean by deployment project? Do you mean like to create a, an MSI or something like that? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I would need some more information on to, to be able to answer on that question. Um, really send us a mail and we'll look into that. Uh, we don't have any HTML5 producer right now, um, so um, but we 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 um, we could actually generate all that later on. Um, you only generate the code. We still have to do the UI. Uh, it depends on the producer you're using. If you want to use a specific producer that will generate, um, I mean, for instance, the WPS smart client that I've shown in the demonstration uh, that was. That that generated the UI. Uh, likewise, for the SharePoint application that I, that you've seen in the demo, uh, that was a fully generated application. But still, if you want to do the UI yourself for uh, like for a uh, a um, B two C website, well, obviously uh, you can create the UI if you want to. But uh, wherever you can industrialize it, you can actually uh, well, well you can do it as well. Uh, web sockets. Uh, no, we don't support them um, right now, but you can you can actually code them yourself using the um, the object model that got generated. Um, great demo. Okay, not a question. We'll see that later. Thanks. Uh, where do I find more information on automating generation of UI? The documentation would be a great start. Uh, there are actually uh, I think there are some technical articles uh, in the documentation illustrating how to uh, generate a WPF application using the WPF smart client. There's also the SharePoint producer that, which you can use to generate an application. There's also an ISP.NET website producer that you can use to, um, uh, in combination with the uh, ISP.NET web controls producer to, to generate an ISP.NET website. We're also going to provide a new version for this producer since now it's, uh, it's five years old now, so it's getting kind of old. Um, oh, that's the same question. Okay, well, I think that if uh, if that's it with the questions, um, we'll end this webinar. And um, thank you very much for your time and your attention. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask them. Before ending the webinar, we're going to do a quick poll. Only two questions. Uh, if you could all answer those, thanks. Uh, at this stage, do you consider evaluating Confluent entities any further? So if you could all please answer the uh, the poll so that we can switch to the next question and final one. A few more seconds and then we're going to switch to the final question.
Okay. And now uh, the final question is, did this webinar meet your expectations? Okay, thanks. Well, thank you very much for your attention. If ever you have some extra questions that pop up afterwards, uh, again, don't hesitate contacting us at info at or on our forums available on our website. Thank you again. Bye-bye.